Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you to this conference on religion and development. My name is Gilles Carbonnier. I'm the editor-in-chief of International Development Policy. And we organize this conference following the release of our latest issue, which precisely focuses on this nexus between religion and development. We have uh, tonight with us uh, actually one of the guest editors of this special issue on religion and development, together with two of the lead authors. And we have uh, uh, also invited an external person, a practitioner, to comment on the reflections of uh, mainly scholars. Actually, uh, <coughs> until recently, we noticed that religion remained uh, marginal in the study and the practice of development. The notion and early theories of development being embedded in uh, the Enlightenment and modernization traditions, development studies have uh, actually widely neglected religion. This is surprising to the extent that the origins of development assistance are very much associated uh, to missionary and religiously inspired initiatives during colonial times. Up to these days, faith-based organizations remain very important actors in development assistance and humanitarian action, as we will discuss later on. In this framework, and noting that the relation between secular and faith-based development organization remains uneasy, the editorial board of our journal decided in 2011 to devote a full special issue to this topic. We invited two guest editors for the special issue, Kalinga Tudor Silva, who is professor of sociology at the University of Peradenia in Sri Lanka, and Dr. Monsef Kartas, who is with us tonight, and is project coordinator of the Small Arms Survey program uh, called Security Assessment in North Africa. We have launched a call for paper internationally, uh, inviting researchers to submit papers either in French or in English on four key areas within this nexus between religion and development. The first was fundamental concepts and theories. The second, religiously inspired actors and faith-based organizations active in development. The third, religion as impediments or as opportunities for development policy and practice. And the fourth area was religions, worldviews, cosmologies, and the limits of development studies. The paper that we eventually selected were discussed uh, with the authors during a two-day seminar that we held at the Institute in 2012. And the discussion went on between external peer reviewers and the authors until the final uh, papers that we'll uh, present in the special issue. Two of our panelists tonight have contributed to the first parts of the edited volume, which deal with faith-based organization and development as a field of research and practice. And they deal also with 
bilateral and multilateral development organizations which increasingly incorporate religion in their programs. The third part, actually, we don't have any author with us tonight, but the third part consists of uh, six distinct chapters that discuss religious conceptions of development as alternative to technocratic neoliberal development with many case studies. <clears throat> the case studies range from so-called Arab Spring countries to South China via Turkey, Sri Lanka, Brazil, and other cases. This chapter discuss religious doctrines, statehood and violence, and they explore avenues in the search for alternative development narratives and strategies. If you want to know more, we have on sale tonight both the French and the English version of religion and development, I think at a discount rate. Yes, so uh, you will be able to, uh, for those of you who are interested, to, to buy a, a book uh, just after the conference. Let me turn to the panelists. We have, uh, we will start with Dr. Monsef Kartas, who is, as I said, guest editor and coordinator of the Small Arms Surveys Program Security Assessment in North Africa, with activities in, in Tunisia, Libya, the region. We will continue with Dr. Philip Fontaine, who is a senior research fellow at the Asia Research Institute, part of the National University of Singapore. And then we will have Professor Jeff Haynes, director of the Center for the Study of Religion, Conflict and Cooperation at the London Metropolitan University. We will have uh, then as discussant Anne-Marie Hollenstein, who is former coordinator of the project focusing on religion and development of the Swiss Development and Cooperation Agency, SDC. And uh, we thank her for ac having accepted our invitation to bring in a perspective, the perspective of a practitioner. I ask the panelists to remain brief so that we have enough time to engage in a discussion with you, with the audience, uh, after the, their presentation. And at uh, 7.30, we'll close, but uh, those of you who can join us, you're most welcome to have a few drinks and snacks in the cafeteria where the discussion can be continued on a more informal manner. So without further ado, uh, Monsef, I give you the floor. So uh, many thanks for you all coming here in such a high number and turnout. Very happy that the subject is drawing so much interest. But uh, I would like to, to thank uh, especially Professor uh, Gilles Carbonnier for uh, giving us this opportunity to Kalinga Tudo Silva and, and me to, to be uh, in this quite exciting and challenging uh, yeah, uh, opportunity to, to, to develop such an, an issue. Um, and I would also especially thank the publication team uh, around uh, Marie Thondel, who have really done uh, tremendous work and uh, been extremely helpful in, in um, navigating through this journey. Um, very basically, the only thing that I would like to do right now is, is highlight and bring up three points that reflections, arguments that came up for, uh, for us, for uh, uh, Tudor, Silva and me, uh, when we were uh, uh, accompanying this uh, uh, special issue. And um, specifically, um, issues that, that we think somehow um, emerged quite strongly or questions and uh, points that need a lot more discussions uh, and um, so I will briefly highlight these three points um, one is that you know there is a central argument when you see the debate on the religion development nexus and um, this argument is always to say that there is like the discovery of religion 
uh, in the last, in the past decade, so to say. And that was a topic that was not, or a concept not at all related to, uh, to development. And um, our point of what we noticed is basically that in the best of cases, you can only speak of a rediscovery. And I think Gilles has already pointed towards it, that in fact, there is uh, an important role that religion uh, played, especially in the framework of colonial development, but also in uh, lots of efforts that have uh, accompanied, so to say, the process of decolonization and transfer of power, where actually uh, the church and other religious organizations have played a very important role in shaping what uh, was and how development theory and practice actually evolved. So religion, for us, somehow, was in fact always somehow a part of it. And this is quite a puzzle, but it's a puzzle that is quite uh, emblematic for what actually is, is happening. The second point that uh, I would like to, to make is that um, one of the really interesting elements for us was to think, you know, to what extent is religion or faith or spirituality, to what extent is that a source for alternatives to uh, the neoliberal dogma in uh, development? And um, the third point that uh, I would like to stress uh, finally um, and, and briefly is about um, some of the major insights or things that um, stuck to us when we were working through all these uh, papers, especially on, on, uh, on uh, um, faith-based organization called always FBO in this kind of acronym. Um, and that in the end somehow provided us with more puzzles and more questions actually than really answers. And that I think is, is, is one of the big issues that in the future research on the question of religion in development is going to be quite important. So on the first point, um, as I said, we came away with this strong feeling that this notion of a new discovery is quite emblematic for something else that is actually happening in the discourse around development theory, and especially around the discourse of secular development. Let me just bring one argument that was uh, brought up by Salinger. And um, Salinger uh, noted in one of his uh, quite famous articles that um, actually it's the absence of religion and spirituality that is a major reason for the failure of development. And I found this is quite an astonishing uh, conclusion to which he's arriving. First, because it provides us first to, to understand that, you know, again, this argument of someone who's worked a long time on this topic is still coming up with this rhetoric of the discovery. There was no religion, and that's one of the reasons of the failure of, uh, of development. The second element that I thought is really interesting about this uh, argument is that he really present the notion that development has failed. And I don't know if I would go as far as to say that development has failed, but I think what he's pointing to is that development is facing a crisis, and a crisis quite since a long time. And uh, I think one of the indicators of this crisis was when, at the time, UNICEF financed this study, which then came out with the title Development with a Human Face, and which was uh, radically, so to say, questioning uh, the vision, the narrow vision of the World Bank and the policies that have been conducted uh, before in, uh, in development. So, uh, my point is basically that I have the feeling, because if you see what happened and what was the answer to, those diff to this crisis of development, is that all sorts of new concepts have came up. Very clear, good governance agenda was a big issue that emerged right after this uh, 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 critique from, the, uh, from UNICEF and later from UNDP. 
but also concepts like participation, local ownership, and so on. But there is something very different when religion came up in the debate as an answer to this crisis. Because with the other concepts, it's somehow an evolution, a continuity. It's not questioning so deeply the issue of secular uh, development. And I think, so to say, the best way one can describe how the secular development discourse reacted, but also used religion as a concept, is one uh, of discomfort with this concept. And so this, um, this discomfort has, so to say, two functions. And the main, first function that I would like is, is, is tied to the, to, the, uh, to the argument. Um, the first function of, so to say, discovering uh, religion is basically not so much about providing a discourse of what religion is, but rather in providing the contrast to reaffirm what is secular, secular development. That it's based on science, rationality, uh, and all the classical, so to say, dogmas of, of modernity, and presenting religion, so to say, as anti-scientific, irrational, spiritual, mystic, even to a certain extent. So the function that was, and that is somehow highlighted in this notion of, of discovery, is much more one, not of framing religion, of providing a fruitful debate about the role of religion in development, than rather a kind of reaffirmation of uh, secular development. The second point is also related to this discomfort that uh, I've, I've told. And because it, uh, there is the potential in the idea of religion, of faith and spirituality, to actually challenge some of the core tenets of secular development, and especially the neoliberal dogma. And I think that was one of the points when uh, Tudor Silva and I were working out on the call for paper where we were particularly excited to see what type of articles would come up and what other scholars would have thought about this option and the possibility uh, of religion to bring development beyond neoliberalism, so to say. And. Um, the fascinating element and one of the pieces that, that came out as a, as a very in good indicator of this discomfort is basically the one by Ludovic Bertina on the, um, so to say, on the, the, the church's interpretation of development and the notion of in, uh, integral human development. Because what you can see here is that the church is actually embracing ideas of science, technology, and progress. But it's providing a very different interpretation of what human development is from what you could see in the terms of UN, UNICEF or UNDP and so on. Because although if UN, uh, UNDP and, and the, all those organizations that wanted to go beyond, uh, so to say, the neoliberal dogma of development have actually provided only a rather superficial critique to it, just asking, so to say, or questioning the very narrow vision and indicators of the World Bank of economic growth, basically. But what the uh, spiritual interpretation is opening up is the question uh, uh, a point that is very important is what is it actually what makes development human? And so it's asking key questions like for whom is developing uh, development done? And who is conducting it in what sense and for what end? So it's a lot more, as you see, you, you know a lot of you who are working in development there is today this very much this, this kind of fetishism with results-based uh, management. While the principle that are guiding, so to say, the process of de development 
is actually not really reflected. So let's restart. <laughs> <laughs> the um, third point that I wanted to make and conclude, so to say, the presentation is the one about uh, the section where we were thinking about the promises and uh, realities of faith-based organizations. And as we had all those discussions with the authors, especially in our two-day workshop in 2012, and we had quite some very, very heated debate, I think, uh, on the issue that I mentioned before, for example, the dichotomy between religious and secular uh, development. And the more and more we entered into this uh, heated debate, the more and more it turned out that actually we have a quite fundamental problem, is that the concepts that we're using are so generalizing and so homogenizing, and especially the concept of face-based organization, FBO, as if there is one ideal, there is one type of organization that is a dif different to secular uh, or whatever, I mean, that's the, the thing. What is it what you're opposing to faith-based organizations? Secular uh, development organizations? And when we started to dig into that, we noticed that actually the range of organization, and I think that is quite well <laughs> reflected in all the articles that you can see on, uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in the issue, is incredibly broad. And that all those actors and institutions who are engaged in development and might be spiritually inspired, religiously inspired, hardly fit into one label, into one box. And that we have to take this into account. And that we have to work a lot more on breaking up all those different concepts that we are working here uh, with. Because, again, there is a kind of political discursive dimension to this way of framing these discourses uh, that I think are uh, quite emblematic for actually the, the rationale under which the development discourse in general is, is operating. How is the time doing? It's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Monsefa. <laughs> Let me also wish welcome to the those of you who are following us uh, via well, live stream, uh, via our YouTube network, and I guess this is the reason why we had a noise which woke us up uh, quite uh, vividly. So I hope it works. Uh, and uh, anyway, welcome to, to those of you as well. And I give the floor to Philip Founding. Thanks very much for coming today, and thanks especially to the Graduate Institute for inviting me back the beautiful city of Geneva. Um, uh, I want to start by um, congratulating uh, Monsef and Tudor and Gilles uh, and uh, the Graduate Institute team, uh, Marie, Emmanuel, on uh, producing uh, a fabulous issue of um, International Development Policy on Religion and Development. If there is uh, one volume you should read on the subject, then this is it. Of course, I need to say that. Um, but in this particular instance, there's a, there's a happy coincidence of also meaning it. Um, the volume brings together um, a, a solid introduction to the state of the debate. Um, it also uh, uh, includes diverse, indeed, uh, contrasting or, or indeed conflicting arguments uh, in the field. And that means, of course, when you read it, you have to leave your thinking cap on about where you stand in the debates. And uh, it includes um, some of the big names in the field, including, of course, Professor Haynes, uh, eminent political scientist and ardent Chelsea supporter. Um, so uh, definitely a volume to read. Uh, my own paper in the volume was self-consciously uh, conceptual. It's entitled The Myth of Religious NGOs, uh, Development Studies and the Return of Religion. Um, in the paper, I sought to critically examine the idea of religion as it is uh, used in recent literature in development studies. Um, is asking the question, what is religion, a silly 
and uh, senseless uh, semantic concern? Of course, the answer is no. Uh, imagine you are in a bar and an attractive person uh, sidles up beside you and says as their opening line, hey, I'm in development. What do you do in response? Of course, there are many potential answers to this, uh, but one of them I suggest should be, what do you mean by development? What kind of development are you in? Uh, before you go any further in that sort of relationship, pays to know what, what, what is actually being talked about. Uh, of course, this is necessary because development is a contested and debated field in which the term is deployed in many different ways. Whenever we hear or read the term religion, we should also ask, what is meant by it? This is necessary because religion is intensely debated. The idea of religion is contested. For example, the notion of agama in the context of Indonesia is not the same as the idea of religion as it is frequently used in the United Kingdom. Religion is a moving target, changes its meanings as it goes in different contexts. In the social sciences, the idea of religion has been intensely debated. Uh, for example, uh, the substantivist school of um, uh, interpretation would frequently follow the 19th century uh, anthropologist E.B. Tyler in uh, something along the lines of religion as belief in gods or supernatural beings, though there aren't all that many anthropologists now who would adhere to that. This contrasts sharply with a functionalist interpretation of religion, something like Durkheim's society self-worship, which binds a community together. The difference between these views is really sharply drawn out when you, you can understand a functionist idea of religion as being flag and anthem rituals as used in the nation state. There is also another school of uh, social scientists who increasingly take a very critical idea about the idea of religion itself. Uh, I'm thinking here of uh, Tal al-Assad, uh, Tomoko Masuzawa, uh, Timothy Fitz Fitzgerald, uh, William Kavanagh, and others who argue, uh, who attack the idea that there is a generic transcultural, ahistorical, that is a universal idea of religion, which is always and everywhere easily identifiable and clearly demarcatable. This idea of religion has a particular history. They argue, uh, these critics of religion, that it also has limited cross-cultural analytical use um, and that it also carries out decidedly political work. So some of them, uh, these critics of religion would argue that the idea of religion is something like a modern Western folk category which is misapplied globally. In my paper, I looked at three different recent texts and development studies. Uh, one cast a very positive construal of the role of religion uh, that religion could play in development. Uh, another cast a very negative construal, uh, suggesting that religion wouldn't play a very uh, strong role in development. And, and the last was decidedly ambivalent. I argued that each of these deployed uh, a problematic concept of religion. And in the article, I seek to instigate a wider debate on how we discuss religion in, de in pardon me, development studies. So why is our use of religion so problematic? I, I have three, um, hopefully, quick points. Um, frequently, the, the discussions of religion are very uh, essentialized and homogenized. Um, one way of looking at this is to ask the question, what does the Muhammadiyah Disaster Management Committee, MDMC in Indonesia, Samaritan's Purse, uh, the Christian NGO from uh, the US, Rashtriya Siam Sivek Sang, the RSS in India, the World Council of Churches, um, based of course in Geneva, 
Tzu Chi, the Buddhist NGO from Taiwan, and the Mennonite Central Committee, the pacifist Christian NGO from North America, have in common? The answer is not a whole lot. And yet all of them are frequently classed under the category of religious NGO or faith-based NGO. The problem with the term religious NGO as I see it is that it erases differences, creates a category and it bundles them all together. But they're not the same. Their differences are profound, uh, dramatic even. Um, so this essentializing and homogenizing tendency, I argue, is really quite problematic. Um, instead of generic studies of religion and religious NGOs, what's needed instead is in-depth studies of particular cases. Uh, a second point about the um, problematic use of religion in much development studies is the assumption of a religious secular dichotomy, uh, an us versus them kind of logic. Um, this is frequently premised on the idea of a church-state split. Um, which has its own distinct history. Um, development is frequently construed as a purely secular enterprise within this kind of dichotomized framework. And because of this, um, not because of this, but the secular is also frequently uh, an unmarked category. It's uh, regarded as neutral, normal. And this is opposed to a abnormal religious incursion in the realm of development. There is, and I hope I'm not being too rude here, a certain smug secularity which deserves interrogating. But what about the ways in which economics is itself mystifying? Or how bureaucracies frequently become enchanted, indeed sacred? Or how, say, gender and development uh, programs assume a proselytizing zeal for transforming others. Or how the missionary roots of development remain profoundly influential, even when they're not explicitly discussed. Or what about the ways in which the Millennium Development Goals become almost creeds recited publicly to affirm our particular faith? I'm here thinking of um, recent work by Michael Barnett, Didier Fassin, uh, Samuel Moyne, um, uh, Ekblad as well in his history of American development, and also Hilbert Rist, who is here today, all of whom really blur those ideas about uh, the secular religious dichotomy and the history of religion and indeed also human rights. So the question I think we should ask, um, again, I hope I'm not being too rude, how did development come to be seen as a secular, universal, and virtually unquestionable moral good, such that religion, religious involvement could be imagined as an abnormal intrusion? I think this is a key research question which academics should be debating. We need to explore also how this secular religious distinction, which clearly does not work in most contexts of development assistance, is disciplined, managed, and practiced. Which is to say, I think, secular aid should be placed at the forefront of the religion and development agenda. A third point uh, uh, is that... Um, the third problem of religion and development studies is, is that it's frequently profoundly utilitarian. Um, a good way to analyze this is when was the last time you read an academic journal article advising implicitly or explicitly a rural community, uh, for example, maybe a, a Pentecostal congregation in Nigeria, on whether to take funds from the USAID or to accept a UNFPA project. It doesn't happen very often. Most religion and development uh, literature implicitly seeks to advise secular big donors on how to use, engage, or mobilize religion. 
The issue is, will religion be positive and how can it be managed? This is, I suggest, a very anemic uh, and limited form of engagement. Development studies needs to do more. Uh, it needs to pry open the possibilities of a wider debate. It also needs to play uh, more diverse roles than simply operating as a development consultant. Um, the role of development consultant is fine, it's just not the only role that should be played. Now, I, I really love a good argument. Um, there's very little I enjoy in life more than a, than a good argument. And because of this, the initial conference was really a sheer delight for me. Uh, uh, it, it was really marvelously good fun, and, and Jeff is laughing as, as he should. Um, I suspect Jeff loves a good argument too, which, which is a particular pleasure. Um, for those of you who, who might not entirely agree with my line of argument, then I, I think you should really read Catherine Marshall's response in, in, in the issue uh, to it, because I'm sure you will love it. Um, uh, Catherine engaged in a really vigorous uh, and challenging response to my paper. Um, uh, I think this is marvelous. I, I think academia should be a place for really vibrant debate. Um, Catherine took me to task, um, and I, I think that's, um, well, that's a sheer pleasure. In her response to my piece, uh, Catherine reiterates a sense uh, of the need for what she calls an adult conversation. Uh, in development about religion. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I think a large part of this will involve vigorous debate, disagreement, and energetic, uh, perhaps even passionate exchanges. I think that would be crucial for any um, adult conversation. And because of this, Catherine's and my interchange, I, I hope, in some ways, embodies that adult conversation, or, or, although, um, uh, yeah, it depends on which side of the line you agree and I think, uh, agree with as to where you, you stand on that. Anyways, um, yeah, such debate is really not peripheral to development, uh, practice and policy. At stake of fundamental issues, what values drive our work? How do we imagine the world that we live in? How do we carve it up conceptually? imaginatively, what is the legacy of Christianity? How do we engage in diverse communities? How do we take religion and also the secular seriously? These questions must be asked and debated by practitioners and policymakers as much as by academics. Uh, at the Asia Research Institute in the National University of Singapore, I'm working with a number of colleagues on a project we broadly titled Religion and Development in Asia, for want of a better title. Um, Michael Fina, Robert Bush, uh, Ke Ping Wu, and, and a number of other colleagues are all working around the theme in the Asian context. Um, we think the topic of religion and development is not just of relevance to development studies, but is also of direct relevance and indeed of great importance to religious studies and other fields. Uh, in this project and in a lot of our conversations, we're asking not just how religion impacts development, but also how development has impacted diverse religious traditions. For example, you can look at the NGOization of uh, diverse traditions, um, which is rejigging power uh, uh, dynamics and uh, authority dynamics within many different uh, contexts. Um, also with the introduction of management speak and uh, grossly inflated financial departments, they're, they're directly changing the ways in which many traditional uh, uh, contexts have, have operated. So you can look also at the way in which development impacts religion. Uh, some commentators have predicted the decline of religion and development since some of the big donors have turned away to other things. Uh, perhaps, um, but I think this is unlikely in academia. 
The, the reason is, is that while development policy waxes and wanes, the field is really intellectually compelling. It speaks to contemporary predicaments. It seeks to uncertain futures. It also speaks to dynamically changing cultural fields, as well as the biases and prejudices of contemporary academia. So I think the field is just, going, uh, is just getting going uh, in, in development studies and elsewhere in academia. And in the coming years, um, I look forward to an increased uh, and, and increasingly intensive debate. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Philip. Uh, for those of you who don't know Catherine Marshall, you refer to her. She, she was uh, the advisor of the World Bank's president in the, by the end of the 1990s to introduce these religion and development reflections into uh, World Bank's uh, uh, policy thinking. And uh, she's a professor at Georgetown, and she wrote also a, a response in the, in the book. Thank you very much. So I give the floor now to you, Jeff. Thank you very much. Thank you. Taking your time. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to once again um, thank the organisers very much for inviting me. Thank the Graduate uh, Institute of um, International Development Studies for organising the, the publication which we're now focusing upon, drawing upon. Um, I'd like to thank Philip, somewhat surprisingly, for, for referring to me in his talk, so I'll do the same, I think. Um, <laughs> My, my topic is religion, politics, and international cooperation. So what I want to do is to draw on the published piece, but also say a little bit about what I'm working on now, which is actually uh, faith-based organizations at the United Nations, which is a fascinating yet somewhat under-analyzed issue. Um, I want to make five points, I think, and um, I want to, to, to start off by emphasizing how... Um, welcome and controversial, I found Philip's comments, and how informative and um, um, s solid I found Monsef's comments. I think we're all in this room for one main reason, which is that we're intrigued perhaps about how we now can't ignore this issue of religion or faith in the development context and of course in the wider um, social scientific context, because wherever we look at international relations, politics, um, economics to some extent, sociology, religion is, a, is, a, is an absolutely um, essential component of how we seek to understand the world now. And you will know, of course, that we're now um, said to be living in a post-secular world, one in which the secular certainties of the past are now less certain. It chimes, of course, with this whole notion of post-modernity and the question about um, mega, mega narratives and um, um, received truths. And I think that the religion and development interface is a very good example of that because, as Philip and Monsef both, both emphasised, when we think about religion and development, we're, all, we're, all, we're, 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 we're certainly on controversial ground straight away. And it's, in, my, in my understanding, I'm an international relations person by, by trade, so as to speak, my, my understanding is the post-1945 world is one which has become increasingly concerned with this thing called development as a focal point of Western states' foreign policies. And it's, of course, it has a whole gamut of, of things connected to it. St strategic gains, helping allies, um, not helping enemies or potential enemies. And I think perhaps the issue of, of actually improving people's lives in the international development context is, is probably quite secondary most of the time. So my understanding of development um, is largely about a, a Western approach to seeking foreign policy goals and strategic gains. And I think that if we look at the issue of development from within developing countries, we see a rather similar outlook most of the time in which governments, of course, talk the talk about development, but end up rewarding their allies, uh, not rewarding their uh, real or perceived enemies, and using development as a weapon of power and authority. And third point, in in relation to that is that, of course, development theoretically can be something which engages grassroots communities, a bottom-up process, but one of the ways in which development has been undermined is this very problematic relationship between the grassroots 
and the elites at the, at the centre. So I feel the whole issue of development, as Philip was emphasising, is, is, is one of immensely important political, um, it's an immensely important political issue. But having said that, we can't now avoid or ignore the issue of how religion and development do coincide or not coincide, how they connect and what the results are. I don't share Philip's scepticism about um, labelling a, a, a handful of disparate organisations as FBOs. I think that the, the FBO label is a useful one. Um, it's a useful one primarily because faith-based organisations designate themselves in that way very often. So if we're looking for analytical categories, it's quite helpful, I think, to use what people describe themselves as. And I think that, that I would prefer the term faith rather than religion, because as Philip points out, religion is, has been vilified in the, the concept of religion, has been vilified by um, some of the people you mentioned, including Timothy Fitzgerald in a very hard-hitting recent book, as being a Western ethnocentric category, which really only fits well with the Abrahamic um, religions and doesn't engage well with what Fitzgerald calls Eastern religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Hinduism Confucianism and so on. But I think that faith is something which draws on values, norms and behaviour within an eth ethical framework. And if, if faith or religion gives, gives anything to a course of action, it gives those things. It gives a framework for what's right and what's wrong in terms of perceived behaviour. So I'm fairly comfortable with this notion of FBO and I use it myself as a, as a, a, as a categorisation. The issue, however, is how the secular world of policy, of diplomacy, of development organisations engage with religion. Because my, my strong sense is that the development industry has built up over time as an essentially secular activity. How far do we go back to explain the exclusion of religion? Well, as an international relations person, I would go back to 1648, the Peace of Westphalia, and the consequential division between what Philip calls church and state um, as, a, as a generic category, which of course doesn't just include the Christian churches, but includes religion as an organised entity more genuinely. And there is a definite sense over time that religion is something to be excluded from the realms of power because religion or faith is potentially a competitor for secular power. So, if we engage with the issue of religion and development from that perspective, then it becomes an issue of power and authority. And if secular actors give up, I know it's not a zero-sum game, but let me, let me use that analogy. If secular actors give up some of their authority and power in this regard, it means that religion therefore has a, has a potential to act in that, in, that, in that context. Whatever I mean by religion in that, in that statement. So I think it's about power, it's about the secular world being exceptionally suspicious of what we might um, casually call the religious world. Why would the secular world feel like this? Because the secular world is convinced that religion is bad news. Religion, as a public actor, is one which was, in the secular view, culpable for many of the pre-modern conflicts. So the, the emergence of the Peace of Westphalia in 1648 comes directly in the wake of the Thirty Years' War, um, a conflict in, in, in Northwestern Europe involving Catholics and Protestants, which we now call a world war in the, in, in the way that we regard conflicts today. So religion in the secular world is very bad news indeed. It's divisive, it's, it leads to conflict, it's something which needs to be kept at arm's length at, at worst, but undermined and marginalised at best. Um, so bringing religion back into the frame, why, why has this occurred? How has this occurred in, in relation to development? Well, we need to bear in mind, of course, the abject failure of secular development models over time. The post-45 focus on development hasn't led to an improved development outcome. You know, if, if we look at GDP figures and so on, we can, we can look at improvements. But of course, as everyone in the room will know, GDP, GDP figures mask a great deal of disparity within the context where those GDP figures are being, being referred to. So as the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, to use the cliche, and the development model, the various secular development models which have been tried since World War II, have abjectly failed. So 
we come to the 90s, we come to the collapse of the Soviet Union, we come to the, the very questioning of the fundamentals of authority and power in Europe and worldwide. And the World Bank, the IMF, and a whole host of international institutions begin to talk about civil society. They begin to talk about a bottom-up pressure for reform and change, which I think is linked to the end of the Soviet Union and the kind of people's power out, outburst of that era. So religious actors, faith-based actors, regard themselves as the epitome of civil society. They regard themselves as representatives of millions of people sharing a faith, looking to those religious leaders for authority, leadership, and guidance. So I think that the, the initiative towards religion or faith at the end of the 90s, and in fact, um, I, I would quite explicitly see this in relation to the Millennium Development Goals, but in particular, the initiative of James Wolfenson, and of course, the, the elusive Catherine Marshall, who's not here, but uh, who was a very major figure in those, in those developments. And, um, Wolfenson is very interesting because he's not an evangelical Christian, he's not a practicing religious person, he's actually a secular Jew. So his idea about religion or faith in development was largely about tapping into untapped um, resources. How can we work with faith, how can we work with religion to make development work better? And um, he began, as most of you will know, with a meeting in 2002 with George Carey, the then Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, this, this led to further meetings with, um, well, representatives of faiths, I guess, that sort of hand-picked people or, or, or self-picked people. And what became very apparent is the World Bank view of development wasn't shared by the faith people. And as Philip mentioned in his talk, there is this question about what development is. Is it just GDP growth? Is it just more wealth? Or is it something more profound about the development of the human spirit, about the development of people as people with well-rounded personalities, views of the world, and so on? There was an immediate lack of agreement about this among the World Bank and slightly, slightly away from this debate, the IMF. They wanted the civil society to come in. They couldn't have the idea of religion coming in on the terms that religion wanted, wanted to come in on. Philip mentioned the World, World Council of Churches. There was an absolute disjuncture. There was an absolutely scathing report which came out from the World Council of Churches on the World Bank, more or less saying, we will not work with these devils. Everything they do turns to dust. We will have no part of them. And James Wilkinson was personally outraged and disappointed by this attack. And this led to a complete disjuncture between the World Bank and the World Council of Churches, which was never repaired. The IMF never really got to grips with religion. It's even more secular than the World Bank, it seems. And um, the way I see this is that this was a particular juncture in history where a number of things came together, suggesting the possibility of faith or religious representatives. Don't forget, we're talking about institutions engaging with institutions here. We're not talking about the grassroots as such. We're talking about representatives engaging with representatives of the, of the international financial institutions on the one hand and the, um, the, the religious communities on the other hand. And I think that the, 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 the concern was and is that the, the the worlds of secular development and the worlds of, if I dare say, faith-based development, whatever that means, simply do not connect and have no means of connecting because development is a completely different term in each of those worldviews. The World Bank talks the talk about civil society, engagement with the grassroots, letting people choose, but it still measures development in terms of GDP growth. There's, any, you know, there's, no, there's no question. The, 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 the foot soldier of the World Bank are secularists. There's, there's very few religious people in the World Bank. Very few indeed. The World Bank has dismantled <coughs> its two initiatives that it introduced in the early 2000s to do with faith. The World Faith Development Dialogue, now run by Catherine Marshall at Georgetown, is an NGO. It has nothing to do with the World Bank anymore. And the Development Dialogue on Values and Ethics, which the World Bank established, was disbanded in 2011. And uh, the argument is from the bank that uh, faith was mainstreamed within the World Bank from that time. Well, I, was, I talked to World Bank people shortly after this, and I said, 
how's it being mainstream? How's it being mainstream? And I said, Jeff, mainstream is just another term for getting rid of. So even though we can be skeptical, I am skeptical about the World Bank, but it's the world's biggest, richest development agency in some, some ways of interpreting it. It's washed its hands of faith. Um, there is, of course, the, the post-MDGs world coming up very fast now. To my knowledge, there's been no substantive planning for the post-2015 world. Is there even going to be a global focus on development anymore? Um, the MDGs, for all their faults, was a very good way of focusing international concern, cooperation, and finance on... on our, I don't share Philip's skepticism about those eight goals. I think they were crucially important goals. Um, some have been achieved, some haven't been achieved. There's been some progress. But the point is that the faith interaction with secular development agencies has never been, well, I was going to say resolved, it's never been institutionalized in a way which can we can look to the future to see it in action. I think, that's a bad, I think that's bad news because people don't trust their political leaders. The people who they trust are their religious leaders. And if there's some way to join up those dots to make the development world interactive in terms of secular and faith-based actors, then I think outcomes would be better. But there is a number of reasons, some of which I've touched upon, which make that virtually impossible to achieve. And I would see it mostly down to secular suspicion and, of course, inter- and intra-religious competition too. That's another dimension I haven't mentioned, but that's a very serious impediment to religious cooperation and development. I think I must be out of time, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff Haynes. I think you have uh, started to take us outside our wonderful ivory tower by referring to what happened in the world uh, with the World Bank. And, uh, and then uh, we will uh, give the daunting task to Anne-Marie Hollenstein as a discussant to try to comment from a practitioner perspective some of the reflections, the issues that have been drawn. So Anne-Marie, please, you have the floor. Good evening. I'm very thankful to the Graduate Institute that gives a chance to make kind of bridge between the findings of research and the views and experiences from the project on development and religions, a joint learning process between SDC, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, and civil society organizations. First, a short history and the basic assumptions of this project. My presentation is based on the findings of a joint learning project on the interfaces of development, religions, and politics, which started in 2002. The project as such was ended in 2010, but the learning processes still go, are still going on. The starting point was the acknowledgement of the ubiquity of faiths and religions in the context of development programs, and on the other side, the observation that these important socio-cultural factors with considerable political impact remain to a large extent in Europe in this course and practice of development programs. We have heard about this problem. In a series of workshops with Swiss NGOs and staff from SDC, we came to the conclusion that in each context of development programs, religious actors and beliefs are important elements of the cultural, social, and political setting. It was therefore clear from the beginning that this issue concerned not only so-called FBOs, but secular NGOs and state agencies as well. I forgot to inform you about my role in this project. I have been appointed the coordinator of the project, a big chance for my own learning processes. Religion and spirituality can be both elements 
of social cohesion and of polarization. They have great potentials for motivation, social mobilization, participation, service provisions, and lately, and sustainable de development. But the spiritual and material resources of religious communities are exposed often from within to sectarian fanatisms and by political instrumentalization from outside. These inherent potentials and risks constitute the essential ambivalence of religious behavior of human beings. Development cooperation must find constructive methods to deal with the tension between potentials and risks. This matter of fact has to be taken in account in the quality management and the professional program implementation in terms of contextuality, conflict sensitivity, multi-stakeholder perspectives, to quote but a few elements. By the way, be it sexuality, the use of material resources or political power, you find ambiguity in all spheres of human life, not only in religious behavior. The acknowledgement of ambivalence became the central focus of the joint project between SDC and Swiss NGOs. I'm trying now to give a summary of the main findings. The results of the project are of overwhelming complexity. And I shall make an attempt to summarize them in three points. First, overcome essentialist categorizing of religions. In, you know, in populist interpretation, Buddhism is categorized as peaceful and Islam as militant by nature. Such essentialist categorizing hinders the access to reality and can have disastrous consequences. Researchers and staff of development agency must be willing and able to understand the complex, often contradictory and ambivalent realities of religious communities. They are challenged not to look at religious phenomena in isolation, but to situate them in the complexity of the historical, cultural, and political dimensions of the contexts in which they work. This is my second point, the principle of contextuality and case-by-case -case approach. In 1999, the sociologist Peter L. L. Berger concluded his reflection on research and religion and world politics by the following statement. I quote, in assessing the role of religion in the affairs of this world, there is no alternative to a nuanced case-by-case -case approach. But one statement can be made with great confidence. Those who neglect religion in their analysis of contemporary affairs do so at great peril. In our project, we choose the elaboration of case studies by staff members of NGOs as leading method for deepening our reflections on how to deal with the ambivalence of religion in a creative way. Altogether, we collected 13 case studies. The results proved that case studies can contribute to religious literacy of staff of donor agencies and their lo local partners. They are able to bring to the surface the often neglected visions and beliefs of the so-called beneficiaries or the, the grassroots. And last but not least, case studies are an important tool to overcome normative 
and essentialist presumptions on given religions and cultures. And my third point, it has already often been mentioned this evening, overcome dichotomizing framing of organizations as secular in opposition to faith organizations. It was the main result of our workshops and expert discussions between SDC and Swiss NGOs that irrespective of the secular or religious foundations of their activities, government institutions and civil society actors are confronted with the ambivalent impact of religion. This led to the recognition that contextualized dealing with potentials and risks of religion has to become an integral element of the professional program management. Religious issues should no longer be considered as a speciality reserved for faith-based organizations. The dichotomy between secular in opposition to faith space should be overcome. The consequences have been summarized in an SDC document under the title Leading Questions and Quality Criteria for Dealing with Potentials and Risks of Religion and Spirituality in Development Cooperation. In this document, SDC does not consider faith-based organizations as a special category. The argument is based on the assumption that each development organization orients itself on Weltanschauungen, ideologies, and somehow faith-based value judgments. It is a duty for each of them to make, to make its ideological position its faith, be it secular or of religious inspiration, transparent to its partners. By the way, if you are interested in getting the results of this, uh, this the results of, of this project, you can get them either uh, in print or from the um, website, from <laughs> sorry, or from the internet, download PDF, PF, PDF. I have a list of the publications with me for those who are interested in getting access. And my last part, some conclusions create synergies between development research, development policy, and development practice. I would like to present a few proposals for future collaboration between, as I said, development research policy and practice in form of joint projects. For example, Analysis of the secular religions of development and their ideological underpinning of development strategies. Or the nexus of religion and post-2015 development agenda. As we know, the debate on MDGs missed the nexus of religion and development. What can be learned for the post 2015 development agenda. Another important issue, fragile states have become a major preoccupation of development cooperation. Efforts to build structures for good governance often neglect the analysis of potentials and risks of religious institutions and faith in a given setting. Case studies could help to overcome such deficits. And the final point, the processes of political radicalization. 
How do instrumentation, instrumentalization and abuse of religious institutions and religious beliefs enhance conflicts in a given context? The actual preoccupation with Islamism can lead to the neglect to neglect the enormous impact of Christian fundamentalists. And I think we could go on with a lot of other issues to be added to this list of preoccupations. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. We definitely have more research uh, and very, uh, a lot of questions also that uh, Philippe and Jeff have uh, raised that resonate with uh, the ones you have mentioned. Let us now open the discussion with you, with the audience. Uh, I will collect a number of uh, comments and questions and then go back to the floor. So Marie, you have a mic. Uh, you can just uh, raise your hands and if you wish say who you are before intervening. So I see already three hands here. If we start in front of us, and then we'll go. Yes. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Diego Gradis from uh, Traditions uh, for Tomorrow, a uh, international NGO uh, working in uh, the cultural field with uh, indigenous peoples in Latin America and touching in uh, faith and uh, values and spirituality in many of our uh, works. Uh, and Mario Lundstein mentioned uh, about the fact that uh, the about mentioned the uh, post 2015 development agenda. Uh, we know that in uh, relation to uh, cultural issues and development, it is one of the aspects which is on the table, probably not on enough on the table of the discussions uh, taking place in uh, New York now. Uh, on uh, the open working group and the uh, general assembly uh, agenda and i was uh, i haven't uh, heard or encountered uh, any discussion so far in terms of uh, faith based organization or religious and development i wondered whether any of you had some specific information if it was one of the topics on the table in the post-2015 uh, agenda development uh, discussions? Thank you. My name is Piers. <clears throat> I'm an ex HAE, or now you call it EU HAEID or whatever. Um, I'm working now for um, the Rotary Foundation, which is a big foundation, which is a not is a secular-based foundation, aid foundation. Now, um, when I, I read the title "Religion and Development," it made me about 40 years younger by the kind of beautiful, sexy items for debates, but which, in my view, bear should not be seen as this religion and development. Now, let me precise. I've been recently for um, uh, evaluating Rotarian projects in many African countries, Central, West, and I've also been to Haiti and other countries. Now, <clears throat> in most of those countries, each, every village has about a dozen missions. You have the church, the true church of God, the God, or the church of the true God, or whatever, and they're all competing. The thing is that the, the person who is in charge, let's say the clerk, he is probably the closest person to the community, and he's probably one of the best educated, because, and that's probably what sta with, it started during the colonial time when all the, the local priests or clerks or pastors were the first who had got a very good, relatively good basic education. And so their problem with development was just transmitting their own knowledge. Now the thing is that religion and development nowadays is getting, I was a bit unhappy about your opposition between the World Bank and the faith-based organization. I think it's a bit uh, réducteur. Um, 
because um, there are other organizations than the World Bank. But the, um, I, I'm not very happy with that title, religion and development, because I don't see the relation between, you can't have a religious development and you can't have a secular development. And if you compare the World Bank or other uh, development agencies, secular or faith-based, um, you just can't make such a, a strict division between both. This is basically my two questions. Uh, my name is Nam Sun Kang. I am teaching at uh, Bright Divinity School in Texas Christian University. And whenever people hear the combination of Texas and Christian, people usually imagine the religious fundamentalism. But uh, my school is one of the most progressive uh, university in the world. Um, and uh, before I make my comments or questions, I really appreciate uh, the moderator, uh, the hospitality that you invite me to the front, even when I am late. Uh, the reason why I am late is that I was having a hard time to locate this uh, place. I'm a total stranger to Geneva. Uh, I am here for a meeting for a couple of days. Uh, uh, I will suppress my, the temptation to ask like seven questions. Uh, I will just ask uh, two questions. Uh, one question goes to Philip Fountain. Uh, I really missed the first uh, presentation. I really, I'm sorry. Uh, I really agree, uh, like 99% of the presentation that you made, I couldn't agree and more. The, the question that I really want to ask to hear what you think is that there is a double bind of defining religion, which means that there is a necessity to define religion, but at the same time there is an impossibility defining religion because uh, once you define something that cannot be fixed, you fix something that cannot be fixed. So there is a kind of uh, impossibility. And uh, also, uh, all the definition of religion, actually, it is a sort of a Eurocentric construction, especially the 19th century uh, Western construction of religion, especially when it goes to the non-Western religion, it really tends to exoticize, homogenize, essentialize. You use the term essentialization and homogenization that I really uh, appreciate. But there is a kind of exoticization uh, and romanticization of non-Western religion. Uh, it's really problematic. So I wonder how you sort of uh, uh, move beyond the dilemma of this double bind of defining religion that once you, you talked about all the uh, problem and uh, the dilemma that you shared. Uh, and uh, my second question goes to uh, the Jeff Haynes. Uh, uh, I really appreciate uh, all the presentation that you make. Uh, I couldn't agree with more. I have two brief questions. You talked about uh, you chose uh, the, the term faith over religion because of the, all the reasons that I really uh, conquer. But at the same time, uh, this notion of faith, uh, so many uh, cultures, there is even no term for faith. So the faith, the term faith is really an uh, Abrahamic religious construction. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have been uh, ra raised in a pluralistic uh, kind of religious pluralistic culture, but if, except those Christianity or uh, Judaism or uh, the Islam, people you don't use even the term faith. So rather than giving up the term religion, perhaps we need to really reconceptualize the religion. Uh, it's, it, it, it is more redeemable than faith. That's my first comment. And question is that, second question is, uh, you talked about the problematic of the term uh, religion, uh, the development. I want to really push uh, harder because uh, the fundamental question that we have to wrestle with is that uh, what constitutes really, uh, the development and whose perspective and whose standard it has been applied and whose interest the development serves. 
because there is no development in general. Development is always context specific. So I really want to hear what you think. Uh, since, yes, yes, since uh, just one, one word of order, since uh, I'm, uh, you know, born and grown up in, uh, in a watch making tradition, <laughs> I'm obsessed with time and I noticed that we have nine minutes to go. So oh. for the sake of uh, making it possible and then continuing the discussion more informally, uh, during the, the cocktail reception after that, what I propose is to leave you the last commented question and then we'll go back to the panel, but unfortunately I think we'll go back to the panel for responses, reactions, mm -hmm. as well as a, as a final word of conclusion so that we can make it more or less on time. Oh. That In that know? case, only two minutes to say this. I am one of those, I'm from Africa, I hope that some people are there from there also. For me, today, religion means Boko Haram. It means Central African Republic. It means Mali, where are heavy conflicts, which are not development. How do we go to educate people to peace through interreligious dialogue? What do we do about that? and what the research could give us as best practices, if they do exist, for overcoming what is going as a destruction of the whole continent. Thank you very much. So I suggest that uh, we start, but what's that? Well, I'm not sure there were that many questions there, so I'll just, uh, wait a minute, was, and, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words. Um, the first question about the post-2015 um, MDGs, no, I don't think there is anything as yet. I think there's a great deal of, I um, don't know whether it's uncertainty, whether it's just not engaging. I think, I think in a way the world's moved on, but I haven't heard anything. The second one was about competing missions. Yeah, absolutely. This is, um, competing missions in Africa is a, is a well-known phenomenon. It's not much to do with religion, but it is to do with proselytizing and, and gaining converts. Um, I, presume, I don't think I would say much more about that. Um, is there a strict separation between secular and um, faith-based development agencies? No. I mean, on, on the ground, the World Bank works with, with religion. The people I'm referring to are, are in Washington, D.C., who are the policy makers. They don't work with religion. But on the ground, yes, there's pragmatists, certainly. You can't work in Indonesia, say, without working with religions and, and development. It's impossible. The issue of essentialization of religion, um, I think unless we have categories we can work with, we can't do anything. So I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with, with working with definitions which are, which are contested, which are controversial, but which most people have some sense, it, it, it captures some sort of reality. I think if we endlessly nitpick about definitions, we will never make any progress in analysis. Who would do that, Jeff? So I, I, I couldn't <laughs> imagine. Um, I think you make a very good point about faith being an Abrahamic construction, but it goes back to my previous point. Unless we agree upon terms we can use, and faith is the, is the flavor of the day. Um, the UN talks about faith, the EU talks about faith, many of the governments talk about faith now. In a way, it's a category which has its problems, but it's also a category which works to some respect. So I would go back to my previous comment that it's not perfect, but it na enables us to take the analysis forward, I think. Um, what constitutes development? Who's interested in it? So absolutely, yeah. I mean, this is a, my very first comment was about how development is a, is, a, is a focus of Western foreign policy interest. And I think that everything comes from, from there. The final very perceptive comment about Boko Haram, Central African Republic, Mali. Yes, why can we see religion as a, as a, as a, as a focal point of conflict? In those three examples you mentioned, it's largely about religious identity serving as a way of dividing communities largely on material grounds. This is, these are environments of shortages. These are environments where land is short, fertile land is very short, jobs are very short, education, welfare, the whole, the whole panoply of development issues are short. And religious identity is a good way of separating out us from them. And Boko Haram, I think, is a particularly murderous um, organization whose tactics of reminiscent of the Lord's Resistance Army and equally as nihilistic. I, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so it was quite remarkable, uh, the question from the front. I, 
which, which stated 99% agreement with, with my position. I'm very grateful for that. Sure. But, but it almost ne never happens. Though, never. Well, it's, it's never happened before. But almost complete agreement with Jeff's position too. <laughs> I, I thought that was extraordinary because I, I think Jeff disagrees with most things I say, and I disagree with most things he says. Uh, so to have someone who agreed with us both was really quite uh, uh, well. It was fabulous, wasn't it, Jeff? Um, uh, so the double bind, and, and this kind of goes to the question about the sexy title. Is that, is that better? Uh, the sexy title of religion and development, get kind of asking, well, how, how useful is that title for engaging in the debate? Um, this also engages with Jeff's uh, uh, comment about uh, nitpicking definitions. Let's just get on with it. Yeah? Um, yeah, so, so um, what can we do? We have to speak. Uh, nevertheless, we have to speak far more carefully. Um, about things such as religion because of the histories that are often brought to it. We have to be aware that the language we use has political implications. Um, what does a title religion and development do? It, it, it introduces a debate, which uh, is certainly in my piece, I went about trying to say it's not quite so simple. Um, and a number of the other contributors certainly did did that as well. Um, but it's not, um, it's not the best starting point, certainly not the end point. Um, but it does serve as a catch call to uh, stimulate discussion. And that's all that I would see it, not as descriptive, but as a, a kind of marker for here's a discussion we need to have. Um, I think in terms of the use of the word religion, I, I'm not sure it is a double bind, um, though, though I, I understand um, what you're getting at there. I, so I think we can just confess that, that it is a moving target. Um, it's used in many different ways. Uh, it's used to mean different things by different people, uh, and therefore we should be really careful in the ways we go about using it, and the ways we go about describing religious NGOs uh, in, 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 in essentialized ways, I, I think is really quite uh, unhelpful. Uh, Talal Assad recommends the, the notion of traditions rather than the no, notion of religion. I think that offers a lot more help. Uh, at least there you, you can kind of see various secularisms operating on a same sort of plane as, as various forms of Christianity and Islam and, and, and others, and I, I think that's helpful. Um, perhaps not all practices, perhaps not all identities fall neatly into a concept of tradition, though, um, so that there's ongoing need for refinement. But, but at the very least, I think, um, when, when we talk about religion, we should acknowledge that, that, that it is a moving target. Um, and I think that would be a step in, in, in the right direction. Uh, that, that's probably all I'll say, but thank you. And now he's Yes, from the point of view of practitioners, I simply would add to this very complex discussion on, about definitions of religion and so on, which is going on for, for years now. From the point of view of practitioners, I think which is helpful is to try to understand what are the world visions, what are the beliefs of the people at the grassroots, which are the most important, should become the most important actors in so-called development programs. And their understanding is for us the most important thing to, to understand ourselves and base our, our programs and activities on their views. But in that sense, there is very little to, to be generalized. You have to start this process again and again. One sec. Yeah, well, I will try. I think first probably coming to the, ver to the most but provocative, so to say, notion, why would we even 
why it's just a fancy title, religion and development, and uh, I could hardly disagree more on, on, on that point. I think that by framing, it's a reality. There is something where there are religious beliefs, there are faiths, there are spiritualities, and people active in such organizations as you have witnessed by yourself, and there is a complex of institutions and ideologies and norms about development and how the world should go on that is taking place. And these two worlds are meeting at certain places and the question is for us analyzing those things and under coming to grasp to, with those things. So I think that's, that's quite contemporary what, what this research is all about, especially if you, re, you, know, you, you, you put in your mind what uh, um, at the time, Tahar and, and Stephen Ellis, one of the first who really focused a lot on this issue, said, you know, as soon as you get out of the metropole and uh, you're in Africa or elsewhere in Asia, then you will notice how important some form of spiritu spirituality is in the daily life of people. And I think that is something we should take seriously, this importance, and also the issue of development because development has been basically imposed in one way or another also in the daily life of a lot of people in these regions of the world. So these are two important issues, one in the, uh, of, of their daily life, and they are interacting. And that's where we are looking at, and I think what we hope with this issue is to say, look at the many ways you can look at it and be aware of all the pitfalls and caveats that are coming with it, both analytically but also in terms of, of, of practice. And I think that's the way, that's what we hope to contribute with, with this number, this issue. Um, and so, also back on the, on the issue of, of um, Boko Haram and the identification of religion, so to say, mainly as a source of uh, conflict. It's, it's funny because basically one of the reasons I was editor is because I'm not really religion and development kind of person. I work mainly on security and development and on religion and conflict, and somehow then came merged as, as editor on with, from these two perspectives on, on the issue. So it resonates a lot what you're saying, that religion can be both a resource of a conflict and violence, but it can be also a resource of reconciliation, and I think there has been a lot of thought about it, how to approach it. And obviously, I guess that one important issue is in that will be exactly what Jeff said, because, you know, it, it looks like a lot of these movements are primarily religious, but a closer look, for example, at uh, the civil war in Algeria will reveal that a lot of what was going there was not just about you know, the GER or something like this, but it was also a lot about land issues and such, and that there is a kind of you know, local micro-dynamic that is taking place, and then there are those, those more meta-narratives of, of division that are used or instrumentalized to justify certain actions and, uh, and to mobilize also people uh, to, 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 to be violent and to, to drive people out of their villages and out of the land that they are occupying and other people are interested in. So you see here again development becomes a very important issue because this is exactly also a central issue. Uh, land property rights, religion as a resource then also of, uh, of um, reconciliation will probably also have to go hand in hand with those very material development issues that are in it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Well, we are arriving to a close. Uh, I would like just to say that uh, when we started to work on this special issue of, religious, of religion and development, our editorial board members most adamant and advising us to, to focus on religion and development were uh, quite a lot of economists who usually deal daily with trade issues, with investment, with uh, completely other things, and I was surprised to have them saying, no, no, this is an excellent topic, we should really do that. And the objective of uh, international development policy is to bring in a dialogue between scholars, academics, researchers, and practitioners, and policy makers. So, I hope that we have contributed uh, a bit towards this. I'd like uh, also to say that what was, as a journey for me, quite interesting is that by focusing on religion and development, uh, I saw that we started to question 
secular development and laicization processes much as much as we were uh, actually looking at uh, religious phenomena as, as, as an object of, of study, and uh, it's been quite interesting to reconsider the secular as the norm. I'd like to conclude by thanking the four panelists for being with us, thanking also all of you uh, for, for being uh, present, participating. I'd like to give a special thank to our two guest editors, uh, Tudor Silva Inatensia and uh, Monsef Cartas. And uh, to conclude, uh, as I say, we will continue with uh, uh, a small cocktail that we have in the cafeteria, and those of us who wish to join are all very welcome, and uh, the panelists and uh, others will be there so we, we can continue the discussion. So an applause to the panelists and to you.